Hi, I'm Sunny Dean. And I'm Scott Drakeford. And this is the Publishing Rodeo podcast. In 2022, we both launched debut novels in the same genre with the same publisher in the same year. But despite having very similar starts, our books and subsequently each of our careers went in very different directions. That pattern repeats itself throughout the industry over and over. Why do some books succeed while others seem to be dead on arrival? In this podcast, we aim to answer those questions and many more, along with how to build and maintain an author career. Everyone signing a contract deserves to know what they're really signing up for. In an industry that loves its secrets, we'll be sharing real details from real people. We'll cover the gamut of life as a Big Five published author, from agents to publishing contracts, finances, and more. Uh, welcome to Publishing Radio Podcast, and this week we have with us Cameron Hurley, who I'm trying not to be too much of a fangirl about because I followed Cameron Hurley for kind of a long time. I first heard of her through reading about God's War book on Matt Hilliard's website, and I read God's War and Geek Feminist Revolution, which we'll talk more about later, but basically it kind of changed my life, and also reading Cameron's blog was one of the first sources of transparency in the industry that I really encountered, so it was a big deal to me today, and I guess we brought Cameron on to basically talk about why don't we just quit, and and the industry in general, so if you want to introduce yourself, Cam- Cameron, that would be absolutely amazing. Yeah, uh, I'm Cameron Hurley. I've been uh, publishing books for, gosh, since 2011, so for a while now. Enough so that now, you know, I'll go in to a con or something and someone will say, Cameron Hurley, I've been reading you since I was a teenager, and they'll have a debut novel out. It's like, all you need is 10 years, and all of a sudden, everyone's been reading you as a teenager, which is good and bad, but my eclectic mix of stuff, and Geek Feminist Revolution is a, a series of essays. I write a ton of short stories, and I have a few collections of those. Light Brigade and The Stars of Legion are probably the ones I'm known for best. Actually, an intern at my day job say to me, oh my god, you're lesbians in space one day. And I was like, yes, Stars of Legion is also known as lesbians in space uh, in on TikTok and on BookTube, apparently. So... She knew me from that, which was very exciting. A a lot of people also know me from an essay called We Have Always Fought, which is about uh, kind of the erasure of uh, women who have been involved in warriors in throughout history. So that's probably uh, another big one. Yeah, so we like to ask us kind of about their publishing journey. I know yours is really long, but if you felt like going over it for some of the people who haven't encountered you before, that would maybe be a good place to start to give some context. Sure. I started what I call the kind of old-fashioned way. I definitely went through trenches of submitting short stories to magazines. I actually went to the Clarion West Writing Workshop in 2000, which was forever ago now, but actually came up through there as well. And then my first book was accepted, I think, in like 2008, the first time, but didn't come out till 2011, and that was God's War. You know, I had a three-book deal... My editor was then fired during the Great Recession in 2008. Then that deal was canceled. I was still paid for it. The deal was canceled. We resold it to another publisher, which was great, except they never paid us, and then eventually went bankrupt and slipped was sold. I had another uh, series that came out shortly thereafter. It sold a lot better. That publisher was also sold. (laughs) So that was fun. I was wondering, are we going to get paid? That was another exciting uh, uh, meltdown. Then we moved over to, I think I did Saga Press, is where I'm at still now, uh, for Stars or Legion and Light Brigade. Um, Certainly had much more stable... (laughs) <laughs> stable thing there the check's clear that was very good and then i've also done a sh- couple short story collections with again some smaller publishers so i have worked with again big publishers again like saga and also again the very small publishers I mean, apex publications just did um future artifact one of the essays that you're probably really well known for is an essay that was called on perseverance and i remember reading this essay when i was in a fairly bad point <laughs> in i guess my publishing life. And I was going to actually read a section from it, that's okay, which I've never really done on this podcast before. Part of this essay, it did appear on Chuck Wendig's blog, but this bit of it, I think, was truncated for, for space. I felt like I'd failed at everything. Life was a ruin. I found myself living in a spare bedroom at a friend's house, unemployed, deep in medical debt, staring at yet another novel, three quarters of the way finished. When I opened my laptop, the sticky note still stared back at me. Persistence in all things in writing in life. 
I finished the book. I'd reached a point in my life where I didn't know how to do anything else but finish the fucking book. Uh, and for those who don't know, the, the essay starts with Cameron talking about how she stuck the, the word persistence on her, her laptop. And it's just kind of the long career path to get there. So I guess I'm curious what it, what you knew about the publishing industry going in, where you first heard terms like mid-list and lead and kind of what you know what was it were people talking about it when you first got into the industry and do you think that they're talking about it now i think there's a hesitation to talk about it publicly it's like any other corporate job you want to be considered easy to work with you don't want to be considered a whiner you don't want to be considered trouble so here are the stories going around about writers who are well they're just really hard to work with or they're just trouble or their project failed because they're difficult. So, you know, you don't want to do that. But I have, you know, certainly gotten drunk in the bar with plenty of people, even back in the day, right? So I was when I did go to Clarion, which was a, you know, considered the boot, cu- boot camp for science fiction fantasy writers. And I met a lot of professional writers that way. So I made those connections fairly early. I was 20 when I went at the time. So I was I was pretty immersed. And I, I felt, even going into that first really wild experience that I had some kind of understanding. I knew it was going to be very difficult. If it was easy, everyone would do it and they would keep doing it. Publishing is really hard. It is a, it, it is capitalism, right? Like they are there to sell books and they are there to make money and they're there to, you know, take their tithe, you know, you're, they're pound of flesh from you. So that is just something that that is how the industry is set up. That said, you know, do we enjoy what we do? And a lot of us do it for the craft. And is it better than digging a ditch, you know, somewhere pop, Possibly some days, some days it may not be. But, you know, I made those connections very early. And so I was able to have those kind of conversations. And I did definitely hear midlist very quickly. It was bitter midlister. You'd never want to become a bitter old midlister. And that is someone who, again, has low sales, who always has bad, you know, um, uh, very negative that it's all publishing's fault. And it's, you know, it's nothing to do with them and their writing. And, and I'm like, oh, God. I never want to become a bitter midlister. So that was always like, you know, the thing you never want to be. So I heard that very, uh, very uh, quickly on. And I learned very early on that, again, the more they pay you, the more they're going to support the book. So you're always fighting for that big advance. That idea being that they are going to invest more because they have, they've already invested. Instead of what a lot of publishers would do, and Tor was notorious for this and still is, I think, you know, they'll still throw out, oh, here's your $5,000 advance, those sorts of deals the first time, and they want to see what sticks. That was a publisher that I was with for a long time um, who did my debut. They published a bazillion debuts, paid them all, you know, five to $7,000 and said, go, see what happens, what spaghetti will hit the wall. And, you know, and sometimes they did, Paolo Bacci Galuppi uh, came out from them, swept every award, it's now considered a classic of the genre. They thought they could, you know, hit that lightning twice, and they did not. <laughs> it ended up going bankrupt. But it is, it is a tactic, right? It is a tactic, and I think they like to, you know, spend. You spend more, you get more. Yeah, and I mean, publishers make money on their aggregate portfolio. They don't necessarily care about each individual point and uh, in their portfolio, and they don't care that it's a person. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. So I I have a question on something you mentioned, and I'm I'm glad you brought it up. So you talked about how people in this industry like to talk about how important it is to be easy to work with, and that's one of the three things: is you got to be good, you got to be on time, and you got to be easy to work with. Can you think of one example of anybody who made it big by being easy to work with in this industry? John Scalzi. Oh, that's a good one. That's a what? But do you think that's the primary no. uh, variable Absolutely in not. his success? Absolutely not. No, he's a, he's a yeah. great marketer, and he had a wife with a day job and health insurance, which yep. which he acknowledges. You know that was that was why he was able to do it all full time, and he made a lot of very smart strategic business decisions. Tor tried to give him. I'm sure he's talked about it, but I don't know now. Tor's tried to give him some shitty deals too early on in his career. Let me tell you, and he said no. So I think, you know, you need to, there's also that is fighting for yourself. In fact, I had my publisher came to me and tried to, and I said, no, (laughs) I didn't need the money at the time. And I'm like, no, I'm worth X. You will give me X or, you know, I'm going to walk away because I don't need, I don't need, I have a day job, which was a great feeling at the time and got, and got the money. They're like, well, I can do, 
there are two books for this or one book at this. I'm like, that, and I'll do one book with you. And that was the correct decision. I, yeah. I think that it, it has to do with a lot of luck, has to do with a lot of business savvy as well. Um, because let me tell you, you know, a lot of people, you know, will will be like, well, I'll, you know, take, I could take or leave this deal. I've had agents who have, you know, I've, one agent who I fired eventually was just like, well, you know, what did they say to me? So our, my first publisher, again, they weren't paying us. They were going bankrupt. They was the, these were the ones who eventually were sold. One of them is still living as a tax exile in Finland, I think. But um, she actually said to me, she said, well, I don't want to alienate them in case for your next book, they're the only ones who make an offer. And I was like, that's how much you believe in me in my career. Fuck you, you know. And here's some things. Like I was getting some sloppy stuff back with, like, other people's names and contracts. And I'm like, this person's not on their game. They're clearly not investing. I'm a little fish, and, and this is a big agent. And I moved on. But it was. But I did have to have that gut check, right? You're always terrified because you feel like the. Here's the thing: you feel like the person as an author where you have the least amount of power because everyone else has all the more experience than you. They literally work for you. All of these people are taking a piece of you and are taking a piece of your creativity and of your work and all that. Um, they would love for you to continue to think that, you know, your work is not valuable and they are not making money off you. But in fact, they are. They're not necessarily doing you a favor. Yeah, this this is a business. You are going to be asked to make some really tough decisions. But I also know that to accept less for something that I know is worth more is, you know, going to be a bad strategic decision. Have I always made the best decisions? Absolutely not. I've had two publishers yeah. sold <laughs> underneath me. I've signed the... To this day, I've signed things and I went, why did I do that? And you just have to go forward, right? There's nothing else that you can do. It's just to understand what you're worth and that that is just, you know, part of the business. It's a business just like anything else. Yeah. I, and uh, yeah, go ahead, Sunny. I was just going to say that I, I love hearing that in a way because it's, you know, I think Scott recently said in like a, a live chat that we did in, in, with Jericho that, you know, you should consider walking away from deals if it's not, like, a good amount of money. And I think people were genuinely gobsmacked to the idea that you could just walk away, you could say no, that you can advocate. Yeah. I've said, I've yeah. said no before. I said no uh, to tour at one point, too. I, didn't, I just didn't like the contract. So you can absolutely say no. And whether that was a good decision or not, I still don't know, right? But, yeah, I, I have yeah. said no. I just, I was uncomfortable doing it, and there was something that told me, you know, if I if they can't move this, this, and this, you know, I just am not comfortable doing this. So just yeah. off the record, I will say that I think if you can't sign a lead contract, it's probably not a good idea, just from our experience. Yeah. Oh, and I, I'll, I will say uh, that yeah, on the record, yeah, Tor is notorious for signing a lot of uh, debuts and seeing what sticks, right? And they'll pay you yeah. very little yeah. and just see you know what sticks. Like everyone knows that, so. Yeah, that's 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 like the basis of our entire podcast. <laughs> um, publishing is not a meritocracy, right? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah it, yeah, it is and it isn't, right? Like the piece that is meritocratic is is simply that I do think still that there is some bar, some bar of quality, and it's a subjective bar, editor by editor, and and sub population of readers, etc. Uh, but there is some bar of quality you have to cross to be able to to convince enough people that you belong in the industry. But beyond that, yeah, absolutely not a meritocrat meritocrat meritocratic. Good lord, industry. <laughs> Your new nickname is Spaghetti Scott. Uh, you know, sleep has been sparse lately, and uh, I deal with a baby screaming in my ears, so my you know my verbal abilities are going downhill quickly. But yeah, I mean, I made the mistake of assuming that once you sign a contract of any size, you're in and they'll operate like a a any sane business would and trying to make the most money possible. And it's going to be this awesome partnership of making the best of, of the assets that you've just agreed to, to work on together. And it's not always that. And I'll just point out that your example of Scalzi was a very good one of somebody who's fantastic to work with by by all reports. Other than him taking a, a blog post and putting it on his blog, which I appreciate, I haven't spoken to him ever, but he's he's reputed to be very good to work with and a very kind human. Even him, the first thing you said about him was, well, he said no to deals, right? 
And that's not the idea of easy to work with that publishers want to put out there, right? They, they want you to feel grateful for getting a deal. They want you to feel grateful for getting any money for something that somebody would undoubtedly do for free. And then they want to tell you that it's your platform that makes or breaks your success when it is clearly not the case. So my point is, fuck being easy to work with. Like maybe don't be a huge dick right out the gate, right? Especially if you don't sell for a ton of money. I'm not advocating for being a, a, a total asshole at any point in time. Like be a good human to these people. But yeah, I, I just do not see value in being easy to work with. It, it I just, in this industry and other industries, it works for a very small subset of people, but it is not everything that people make it out to be. I'll just say as well, a lot of writers have, I've encountered this sometimes where writers will say, you know, when the subject of advances come up, oh, I would be so grateful to get any advance, even if it was $500. And I always think like, don't, you shouldn't be grateful to get like a, a tiny advance. Like if you want to sign that and that's the right thing for you to sign that contract, that's the right decision to make, you know, no judgment. But the idea that we should be grateful to receive a really small amount of money for what is like months or years of labor is ludicrous to me. Yeah. Like be angry and sign the deal if you have to. Yeah. I think there's being a doormat and there's being easy to work with. Right. I think yeah. there's, there's yeah. standing up for yourself and knowing what you're worth and then, you know, being a doormat. So I, I think that there's there's nuances in there. Like, um, I still at my day job, I'm a lovely person to work with day to day, but we go into review time, I'm like, here's why you need to pay me all this money. Yep. And I think they respect <laughs> you more for that because you understand your worth. Now, day to day, yeah. am I delightful? Yeah. Absolutely. But I also know when we go in and we negotiate that I need to work. I, I've, I've uh, told a very well-known Hollywood producer came to me and said, "Well, you know, we've been we've been optioning bestsellers for five thousand dollars. I don't know why you seem to think that you need more money." And I I said to my agent, "I said, well, you go tell them to go option a bestseller. Fine. <laughs> if they're interested, that's great. Then you come back to me, and if they're not interested, that's not someone who's going to fight to make that made, and they're going to squat on your IP, and you're going to sit there going, oh." This Hollywood producer is sitting on my thing, and it, they will squat on your IP for five hundred dollars a year, and not do a damn thing with it. Is what's going to happen. And you can go and tell everybody, "Oh, Michael Bay is going to direct my feature," and I'll tell you right now, it's not going to happen. Whereas if they are investing in you, and they're like, "Well, shit, we need to decide if we're going to be paying this someone ten, ten, twenty thousand um, dollars." Um, every time, which is they walk, they fall out of bed and make ten thousand dollars, right? Then they have to decide, oh, this is worth, you know, investing ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars, or it's not, and I'm going to drop it. You know, the ideal is to do what, what you know, Gibson and Neuromancer, where what he's making, I don't even know what he's. Doing. Let's just say twenty thousand dollars a year at least in option money for that every single year. That's what you want to do for twenty years, yeah, but not five hundred dollars a year <laughs> yep. when it could be made and make you you know, half a million dollars. So I think it's understanding the reason they are giving you a hard time, the reason they're, especially Hollywood, now I'll get on Hollywood, but is wasting your time is because they do know that it is valuable and it is worth something. So I was just going to quickly ask, um, I remember on your blog, you, you were one of the first authors I found who would actually do like yearly breakdowns of income and stuff. And, you know, given how secretive pub people can be about publishing and particularly about money, I wondered if there's anything that particularly sort of motivated you to be transparent to go out of your way to share details like that and just to, to dive into it so i felt like a failure <laughs> uh i felt like a failure because i had published you know what have i published 12 13 books i do a short story every month for patreon and i could not make the numbers work i could not you know, get my stuff. I mean, I probably like if I could make I could make an I could make enough writing right now where I could probably get like an entry to see you know like an entry level job or something somewhere. But God knows if you need health insurance in America, that's you cannot survive on that. So, and I kept wondering what's wrong with me. And what I suddenly realized is that most authors are lying to you. I would be on panels with people and they'd be like, "Well, I've been full time for blah 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 blah." 
they have a spouse with a lot of money and health insurance who is, you know, helping them go full time for either X amount of time, you know, five years or something or forever because they're taking care of the kids or doing something else, you know, whatever. But they were not honest and transparent about that. And for me, I think for the first 10 or so years that we were married, you know, I was the one who had the health insurance. I couldn't quit my job. There was no way that that was going to happen. We actually got married because his health insurance, this is before Obamacare, his health insurance was going to run out. We were going to be screwed. He was like, I'm going to die. For me, I needed to realize, you know, I wanted to be transparent that just because someone seems to be successful, quote unquote, um, there are some years I'll make $5,000 writing that year, right? With Patreon now, I make much more, but that's because of Patreon. I make way more on Patreon than I do in book advances every year. Let me tell you, especially because I'm way behind in this current book. Because let me tell you, you get behind because of a pandemic or something like that. You don't get paid until you send, cause you send them the rest of the book. So you're just sitting there going, crap, I need to finish a book or I'm not going to get paid. So it's, it's understanding the way that those economics actually work. And just because someone has written a seminal novel or has written... 25 novels does not mean that you know they're not waking up at 6 a.m. and going to be uh, a marketing strategist and getting yelled at by clients all day. That's what I did today. <laughs> so you know it's it's understanding that there's a lot more going on in the background than a lot of people will present, and I think that it gives especially newer writers this really warped view of what success means, of what that trajectory is. Martha Wells was putting out you know, book after book after book since I was a teenager mm. and, and not really like it was just, she was just this reliable, wonderful storyteller and nothing broke out until Murderbot. And she even said at one point, she's just like, I, I didn't realize until I looked up one day that my career was almost over. And she ended up signing with, you know, one of the publishers that I did that went bankrupt, which is how I met her. But I, I think that people forget that sometimes you can go, Victoria Schwab talks about this. She, her first, what, 11 books were mid-list yeah books that was out of print within two years her first book and I like those stories because they are much more typical of the actual experience that the vast majority of writers have it's Obama progress is not a straight line right there are times when you are in the dumps and your publisher is sold and your contract is canceled you think you're never right again and there are other times where it's like holy crap I just want a Hugo and you're not going to know what the next thing is because every single book that you write is a lottery ticket right in fact that that lottery ticket is actually much better than the odds than the lottery ticket that you'll get you know from the five and dime down the street so there's that to think about but yeah, I think that that was always really important to me is when I would have had those conversations like we've talked about before in the bar and stuff afterwards, I'd learn all these things that when, when they said I'm full time, I was not associating with I'm mm. full full time writer. Do, do you know, do you think many people do break out? Because I feel like I know more people who bomb out through no fault of their own for mid list than who break out. But you have been around a lot longer than me. Most people quit. <laughs> Yep, most people quit. I have an entire cohort of people. I mean, my clarion mates, the people I came up with in my early 20s, I remember them starting to kind of peel off either because they were getting academic jobs or they got jobs in game writing, which was really cool. It was really, really interesting to watch that happen because, it. I did, again, you always would ask yourself, why does that happen? And it's because of life. It's because of disappointment. It's because you can't make it work financially. It's because, again, you have kids or someone dies or, you know, your spouse loses, you know, health care, you know, something horrible happens and you have to, you know, change the way that you're doing it. I know Jim Hines, his wife passed away. He had to go back to doing a full-time job in addition to his work. So I think that there's an accumulation of, you know, life that can really get to you. Um, and money can help protect you, you know, from some of that. So if you are already making a lot. I think you're much more easily protected from some of life's ups and downs than if you're still kind of struggling in that early mid list. So yeah, I mean, I'm not going to mince words there. No, most people will quit. Most people will burn out. Most people just get tired of doing it. Um, there are very, very few who keep getting up every day and will keep going like a Martha Wells until, or, or George Martin is another, frankly, another example. He went to Hollywood. His first book tanked. He went to Hollywood, built a whole career over there came back first three books of game of thrones did not do super well they actually came out and mm. uh, really did a huge marketing push for i think that third book actually it was the third book 
because they realized, well, crap, we we bought five books, <laughs> so we really need this. We need this to actually be a success. They put a lot of money behind it, and that helped that book, um, you know, reach a more of a successful level. And that was what he was in his sixties at the time. So I think you know, no, most people will not break out. But I will tell you huh. that the surest way to ensure that you never break out is to quit. That's really interesting. I I didn't know that. Uh, you know, I was, I was a kid at the time, but I didn't know that Martin's first few books in the in that series didn't do all that well. And that's really interesting and reminds me of an interview I heard the other day with Tom Doherty talking about The Wheel of Time. And it was almost the exact same scenario. They had signed Robert Jordan for uh, five or six books. And I don't know how well the first two books did, but I want to say, God, I need to go look, uh, uh, listen to that interview again. But I think he said that they printed a million copies of that, of like the first, I don't know if it's the first quarter or first third of the eye of the world. They printed a million yeah, copies first trilogy. Yeah, of that, like, first bit of the of the first book of the wheel of time and they distributed yes. a million of them when the third book came out and but it was only at when the third book came out and so yeah it really it really does seem to be a matter of your publisher who has a shit ton of money and all the right channels to pour that money into are they going to make you into what they want right and one one other thing i'll i'll ask uh, rather than uh, slash mention is I'm curious Cameron whether the people you've seen quit actually quit which I don't blame them at all because uh, you know at some point you have to weigh the the benefit versus the the damage done in, in the industry but everybody I know that has quit or is in the process of quitting was actually drummed out first like it, it's not that they had a deal on the table and turned it down it's they took a mid-list deal for their debut they did most of the ones i know of actually did fairly well for the deal they signed and then they just weren't supported at all and now their no careers offers, dead. no agent support yeah they're dead yeah they, they can't get another deal they're they're having to submit just like they were a debut again and they can't get attention from anybody because they're not new and shiny that's what I'm seeing. Oh, you just have a pen name. Daniel yeah. Abraham did that three times. He's James S. A. Corey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His first two names failed. Uh, yeah. Usually, what you do is you make a new name. So the best story I have, I think it's, I think it's public, so I can, I can share it. Daryl Gregory, Midwest writer for a very long time, uh, signed up with Seth, Seth Fishman, new agent. Agent said, "Listen." I'm going to send your this book. I think this book is fire, but of course you're midless. So I'm going to tell them this book, when I send it out, this book is from a well-known established writer. And I will tell you the name of the writer. If you make a bid on the book and we can change their name if you want, but I believe in this concept so much that I think you're going to believe in it too. So whatever his pitch letter was, it was genius. Mm. Sent it out, ended up in a, I don't even know how many book auction or uh, house auction. Um, and yeah. when they told them the name, who it was, they're like, hey, do you want him to change the name or not? And they ended up saying no. But he was able to sell it by keeping the name quiet about who it was. And I actually remember saying to him at one point, too, because, again, I was five, six, maybe eight books deep at that point. And I went to fit, went to uh, Seth and I, I, I said to him, I said, thank you for Daryl. Daryl gives us all hope. <laughs> He's like, oh my God. But it was a brilliant strategy, right? Because again, yeah. this is this is a business and it is true. You get boxed in as you are a certain type of writer who uh, appeals to a certain type of audience and that's all that you can appeal to and you only write certain types of books. Most of the people that I know just use another name because it is true. Yeah, I have, I have one. In fact, I have two friends right now really struggling who, again, these are bestsellers, people you've heard of, wonderful people who made tons of money doing it and have just found that that audience is, you know, less and less and less each time where they're now just going, okay, I'm just going to have to have a new name. And that might be that you just have, you know, Cameron M. Hurley or K.M. Hurley. It doesn't matter. You're just, it's stupid. It's the dumbest thing in the whole world, but it had to do, it has to do with the way bookstores 
buy books and the, again the attention that debuts get and I, I'll, I've even seen people uh, be like okay someone has only written science fiction so they're like here's their debut fantasy novel yeah you know them from other science fiction but this is their debut <laughs> fantasy like little things like that like again my day job is marketing and advertising so I understand like a lot of that BS as well is that it's all about making something look brand new and shiny lesbians in space, something that people get really excited about or that they latch onto that's easy to disseminate. Um, and debut, fresh, shiny, new, is always going to be something that sells. Or that, again, like you have a Daryl or um, Chuck Wendig is a good example of this too, where sometimes you just have a concept that is so, it's so high concept that it just it nails it right away. Um, yeah. Chuck Wendig is a great example of someone just writes his tons of different stuff in a ton of different genres and hopes something hits and occasionally something is hit. So, yeah. Oh, and also, yeah. um, my agent has absolutely said, she's like, the only thing I know that 100% sells books is printing and giving away a shit ton of books. Shit ton of books. Yes. That's it. Yep. It's funny. We, I think the, one of the make, big differences between me and Scott in our debut year is um, – between my two publishers that they gave away probably about a thousand print arcs uh where scott they wouldn't send any so they, yeah they made <laughs> Sorry, zero scott. and then... you, you can come back in two years instead of scott drakeford you'll be drake scott drake scottford <laughs> names you'd be daniel abraham going through the names let me tell you yeah well, I am suddenly glad that scott drakeford is not my real name maybe i can give my real name a shot and be extra white guy vanilla. <laughs> my my real name is Scott Smith, by the way. Not, I'm I am i am not yeah, very Googleable. Yeah, I'm I am not uh, super afraid of doxing myself. Good luck finding the right one, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of us. So I I have to ask then being that you you know you've seen this before where people have gotten a, a what they deserve maybe based on the quality or or concept of the book by hiding their name or going with a different name sun yi fangirled and sent me a whole bunch of your past articles that you've written in in various places your blog and elsewhere and they were all fantastic by the way but one of them you you said that you Based on just your sales, you merit a six-figure deal, but you still haven't gotten one. Have you considered submitting under a new name, uh, even if it's just a, you know a slight variation? Or why do you think that has been such a challenge, and, and what's your uh, next move trying to get there? I think it's going to depend on a few things. First of all, uh, one of the reasons I'm not giving up the name yet is that each book that I've published from a major publisher has done a little better than the one before. Stars oh, or Legion yeah. did better than Mirror Empire, or yeah, and then Light Brigade did better than Stars or Legion. Um, this next one, if I ever F and finish it, hopefully will do you know better than that. So you want a little bit of a stair stepper in your career, and I am still yep. seeing stair stepping. I, I and again, I've done some small press stuff because I know you just try and sell short story collections very hard. But all the major ones that could come out got lots of really great reviews. They sold incredibly well. You know, Light Brigade, I turned back my advance and almost twice my advance, I think, in the, in the next two years. So it did really well. But when I, I have to have either an amazing concept and a finished product, right, to show an editor to pitch or to have that stair stepper that I can show someone this is why, you know, you should you should do this. So, you know, this last book, it ended up being, it's a one book deal, and this is a saga, um, and they also have an option for the next book. So I need to finish this book before I can even think of, you know, what I'm going to be doing next. But what I would like to do, and this is the reason I like to do it, is I actually want to finish something. I sold this current book on a one line I don't know. It was basically, he was like, I want Cameron Hurley's next book. And I'm like, okay, pay me X. And he's like, okay, well. So on a one line. So what I would like to do is actually finish a book, which I have not, I have not done on, like, finish the actual full book and then send it. I'm going to make more money, and that is always the case. You're going to make more money on a book that is finished than on yeah. three chapters and synopsis. You're just, you just are. So that is what I would like to do. It's going to take longer, but I think at this point, I've already had a huge break in my little 
My, I was so excited. I was so happy to have a book a year out and then, you know, got burnt with the pandemic and everything. But I think there's been enough of a break now. In fact, I was talking to Ann Leckie. She's like, I even told them I'm not doing a book a year. I'm doing every two years because it's just not sustainable. And that's with her doing that full time, right? And I have a day job full time that I'm doing on top of the writing and the short story a month and all that. Um, yep. So I have to take that into account. It's okay. You know, I want to get a really solid really good can't put it down um book that someone can go okay cameron hurley has an existing audience and i can see how this will cross over so you have to do that and you have to show them that right you have to show them that that work for them uh, the biggest thing number one thing i always heard when i was trying to break in was i don't know how to market this i don't know how to market it so you know my agent's job and my job as well tangentially is to have just to create those synopses to create those one line pitches that get everybody excited it's killing eve meets die hard in space you know and they will get really excited so that's that's my goal as well as to remember on the marketing side is to get them very excited and to you know finish a book so so yeah i think i'm still in the process of you know building that career i think i will eventually get there will i be 70 when that happens possibly (laughs) 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 Let's let's be real so it's just it's just a matter of having a lot of lottery tickets and showing that you can build an audience and so far i'm showing that i can build an audience i need more lottery tickets yeah i mean that does seem to be the way of it and what i i hope uh, that's that's my quickly growing realization i guess and and you can correct me or other people can correct me but it seems like there are three paths people take in publishing one is you get big real quick and if you're lucky you stay big two the middle path is yeah two the middle path is you take a shit deal and you do better than that shit deal and you stay in the shit deal world until you've written enough books that are making a small little amount that that adds up and that becomes you know your own little personal portfolio of passive income or the much more common one is you take a shit deal and you just get kicked in the ass and you're out on the curb after your first deal <laughs> like i don't see a lot that fit in the cracks you know there are cracks but that that seems to be you know the the three major paths and i hope people understand that and i hope people can come to accept that before they learn it for themselves which i didn't i was very stubborn with respect to that and and you know wanting to beat the odds but if people would realize that before they get their asses kicked then maybe that will help the supply demand issue that's killing incomes (laughs) i know a lot of people find it bleak but i think i always feel like you're better off knowing what you what you need to know to make informed decisions like if you want to know less about publishing you can always just like it's so easy to not know anything that's going on i'm not sure it's going to help you (laughs) but this does actually lead me to another question if that's okay which is i'm wondering you know as we're having this discussion about all the paths and how difficult they can be and, and how difficult it is how often in your career have you heard someone say the words why don't you just self-publish? <laughs> so I do self-publish. I write a short story yes. every month for Patreon. I also have a couple of short stories on, and I make like $5 a month or something on Amazon for short stories. Why wouldn't I self-publish a novel? Um, I know a lot of people who self-publish, very uh, good at it. Also burn them the fuck out because you are, you think, you think publishing is hard. Let me tell you about the Amazon algorithm. One year, you might make $86,000. The next year, and I know a guy did it, you'll make nine hundred. So the Amazon, so you again, quit your job thinking, oh, this is great. I know another one who had a bunch of health issues made. I will not even say the number of money, but then had health issues and could not keep up with that pace, which was you have to write something like, and even if they're short, even if they're 100, uh, 100 pages, you're writing six, eight, ten sometimes of those a year. And as soon as that production stops, that algorithm goes, boop, and it shifts things around and changes things out, and suddenly you're not making, you know, $100,000 anymore, right? You're making a few thousand dollars. You're making five or six or seven. And you don't know when that's going to happen. And I have found that I am, one of the things I started very early in my career was this knowledge that um, it's that idea of a thousand true fans, Whereas if I can build an audience of a real core Cameron Harley aficionado, you know, go to war for me, you know, audience, 
that that is my base and that I always will have someone to come back to and that's Patreon, right? Um, which does which does pay me enough to pay my back taxes, which is great. And I think that it's it that was really important to me. I think Catherine Valente actually was where I got kind of that idea from because she started that very early like LJ days, live journal days, where she was actually putting out like this chat book and she would do it by hand and all that. But she was making this really dedicated group of fans. So yeah, so I've done that. Um, so yeah, I, I could do it. It's just you become you become encumbered to another you know corporation. People think yeah. straight to your audience. That's easier, right? Um, yeah. Through Patreon, through direct donate, you know, donations, things like that. You, it's much easier and much more profitable for you to have an email list and do a newsletter and keep that up than it is to say, I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff on Amazon. So I think there's a strategic way, just like any business, right? Just like publishing, mm-hmm. there's a strategic way to just self-publish. But that's the thing, too, is people forget just self-publish means I need to find an editor. I need to get a cover artist. I need to, again, I need to market this. I need to build an email list. I need there's a lot of other things that go into that, um, just self-publishing to make it successful, and then you don't know what the algorithm is going to do to you day to day. So um, I think it's better to be hybrid. I really love the idea that again I have this great, um, you know, regular income that I get from Patreon, and then twice a year I get paid my royalties, and then whenever I actually turn in a book, I get paid another payment. I like having those different income streams. As soon as you start relying on one. Mm-hmm. What if Tor is sold, you know, and then bleeds authors? What if, you know, Harper Collins decides that the editor leaves? I mean, the editor leaving is like a huge thing because then you're an orphan and then you're like, oh, I just don't want, I'm not into your books, go find someone else. Um, So the more, you know, varied you are in those income streams, I think the more successful that you'll be. I I appreciate that answer a lot. And also I feel a bit bad for springing it on you, but I I thought that you would answer it well, but also because last week um, Scott and I did a kind of live session for Jericho writers. And, you know, while we're talking about trad publishing, there were a lot of people in the comments saying, Oh, why don't you self publish? And I always really struggle with this question because it, it, to me, it's like, it's firstly, it's the assumption, like just self publish. Like it's really easy. That always (laughs) winds me up. It's like, the people I know who self-publish work so goddamn hard. So the idea that it's like you can just switch gears and suddenly it's a lot easier is kind of wild to me. I don't think that's accurate. Yeah, it's a very different um, But also because to me it's it's not a solution. It's a career change. It's like saying someone says, oh, I want to be a teacher, but, you know, the, the industry kind of sucks right now. And someone's saying, well, you know, just go be a librarian. It's like, well, no, <laughs> it's not. Well, and I think, I think they need to understand this too is a lot of people treat – just self-publish as a slot machine. It's just, I've got to over an ATM. Yeah. I'm going to go and they'll just money come out. The average self-published book makes $250 a year. The average traditionally published book makes about $3,500 a year. And that's just the first year. Whatever happens after that, God only knows. And I think people think that, well, if you just put it up online, if you build it, they will come. That's not how it works. And so, like, yeah, just mm-hmm. self-publish is always... We'll just grab the money. The money's just sitting right there. If it was that easy, literally all of us would be doing it and we'd be rich millionaires on yachts right now. And none of us are. So, you know, just self-publish is is definitely not, um, it's not an ATM. I, I think people mean well, but it is honestly the, the reason why I left most writer groups online, like in Facebook and, and kind of forums and stuff like that. Because, I, you know, in a number sense, we are kind of the smaller population and just seeing like every time if I post asking for trial advice but I see someone else posting for trial advice it always devolves into people just telling you to self-publish and it's like you're just telling me to quit it's not helpful and if I if if, the, if this conversation reversed and I was saying this in the 20 books to 50k group I'd get kicked out if I was just telling people go query every time they have an advertising issue with Amazon <laughs> sorry I was around <laughs> go get an agent just just get an agent I mean they, like oh we'll just get an agent it'll be fine it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd go over well. Okay. So my, I guess, big question of the episode is we do talk on the podcast a lot about the, the realities of pub and trad pub, and it's not supposed to be all bad, but a lot of it is 
not what people want to hear and not what they imagine the industry would be like. And I guess particularly what we're discussing today and, you know, the frank realities of how careers pan out. What would you say to people listening who want to know why do we keep doing it? Why should we persevere if, if there's anything to say to them at all? Well, and here's the thing. The greatest joy you're ever going to get in this industry is the work, doing the work itself. If you do not enjoy what you are doing, you should not be a writer. I know a bunch of people, I want to be a writer, and they don't read books, or they don't make time to write, or mm. they, then you don't want to be a writer. Because let me tell you, the, the greatest joys you will have are actually in the work. I remember rereading The Light Brigade, which has this intricate time travel plot, like the fourth or fifth time, and watching it, all the beats were in place correctly, and the when you're watching the mechanics of it work and it all seemed to full circle it in and the the realization that I had written the book I wanted to write was like the coolest feeling in the world and that it worked I couldn't believe it fucking worked I was like holy shit I told my agent Anna we pulled this off she's like I know this is amazing like that that moment of joy and of uh, creation, right? We're, we're making something out of literally nothing. There are thoughts in our heads and we are putting them together into patterns so that other people can see those same things. It's magical. It is fucking magical. If you are trying to get, and this, I run into people all the time who are trying to get some kind of validation from the publishing industry or some kind of feeling of self-worth from the publishing industry, you're in trouble because you need to define what success looks like for you. For me, there are too many things I can't control. I can't control whether I'm a bestseller. I can't control whether I win awards. I can't control whether how many comments or reviews that I get. All I can control are the words on the page. All I can control are people I surround myself with and interact with. All I can control are people, again, that I choose to do business with. So it's like, Focus on the things that you can control and you have to let the rest go. And that's absolutely easier said than done. I've lost years, you know, that first publishing deal that I did and the, the ramifications of that sale. And it was just a disaster and it weighed on me for years. But you have to let those things go because you ha literally have no control over them. And so that is why... I really like to tell people to focus on the work, focus on getting better at the work. For me, success is about, I want to, every book I do to be better than the book before. I want to con continue to complete books. I would love to continue to get contracts, but let me tell you, I can't necessarily control that either. But as long as I'm still sitting down, I am still writing stories, I still am a success to myself. I have to define that for myself because if you're waiting for publishing to do it, you are always going to feel like a failure. And I will, I will tell you, there are people making a million dollars who still feel like failures. Always something, right, that people are going to say, well, I wish I had, well, no one takes me seriously, right? Or the critics never, like, I get so many people on Reddit are so mean to me. And I'm like, who cares? You're on a yacht right now. But there will always be something <laughs> that you find if you are not, you know, defining success for yourself. <laughs> People always ask me when my third book's coming. <laughs> oh, 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 no. There's some genuinely good people in publishing. You know, Sanderson is actually a genuinely good person. Scalzi is a genuinely good person. Martha Wells. There are a lot of genuinely good people. There are, then there are other people. So, you know, just, yeah, find, find your people and surround yourself with those people. So, yeah. Amen. Probably the only good thing you're going to take out of this industry is very small checks and very good friends. Very good friends. Yeah, but the, the friends are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> the, the friends are amazing. Yeah, when, when you start to look back, um, you know, again, I look at the people I'm bitching to every day, you know, on our Slack channel. And just like, <laughs> how do I know these people, you know? And it is. It's, it's extremely gratifying. The kind of people that you meet, fan interactions can be absolutely wonderful. They can be weird, but they can also be really wonderful. And, it, you know, and again, I think you do need to focus on those little joys because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Most yeah. of the time it doesn't. But the times that it does, it's that success bias, right? So survivorship bias. You're either you, you hit it or you don't. So all yep. we think of, oh, yeah. Scalzi and Sanderson and, uh, uh, and it's like, that is an anomaly. That is like the exception to yep. the rule, which is the door dungeon. 
It is true. Yeah, once you're in the Tor dungeon, you're in the Tor dungeon. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Cameron. And, and the problem is you've never, you know, normies especially, before you get plugged into the Whisper Network, you've never heard of the thousand people who got drummed out of the business in the last three years, you know? Where, where do you go, though? That's my thing. Where do you go? And that's where I went yeah. to is, you know, I've published with, you know, the smaller publishers, and that's supposed to be really good, and that was all terrible. Apex yep. was good. Apex, you know, Apex and Tachyon. Tachyon was a lovely experience. They are wonderful yeah. people. Can't pay you too much, but if you also sell audio rights, you keep audio and sell audio, it's not too bad. Lovely to work with, but you're not going to sell billions zillions of copies. But yeah, there's it's it's like you hope to get a good editor. Like you think of Tor, Tor is a fight mm. of editors, mm-hmm. and a lot of people have explained it to me like that. Yes. So if you get an editor with a good fiefdom and you get on their good list, then you're in and you're yep. good and you're solid. Otherwise, you're in the tour ditch. So it's it's really depends on which fiefdom, which is why your agent is so key in getting you to the right fiefdom. And I yeah. think it's that way at some other publishers too. It's just like you have to get in. With the right, and that's why when an editor leaves, it's so devastating. Is because you lose yeah. your champion in a publisher, and they probably suck too. You just haven't heard about and it. They also do, yeah. They, and everyone's had a shitty experience somewhere, so it's just trying to make the best of the least shitty experience, um, and and hopping around. So yeah, yep. That I mean, that really seems to be the key. Is you just gotta talk your way into. It getting so much money up front that they can't afford to fuck you over. For anyone listening, we had to cut about half an hour of this podcast episode because we just kind of branched off into discussing things that were off the record about publishing and our personal publishing experiences. And that's why there's a little bit of a disconnect in this conversation. And my apologies for that, but uh, hopefully you can pick up the thread and towards the end of it again. Do you want to do a wrap up, Scott? No. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't even know okay. what you're talking about at this point. Very, We've very... evolved into like half an hour of just talking shit. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? That's my, my final question. Was what worth it? Publishing? Writing? Yeah. yeah. The, the, whole, morning, the whole journey. The whole journey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the whole journey. What else was I going to do with my life? I think... I that's think a that, fantastic that's, answer. That's the thing is, oh, was it worth it? Well, what else the F are you going to be doing all the time, right? Um, I, I think about it all the time. It's like, yeah, I can keep binge watching, you know, Midsummer Murders for the 657th million time. And I do. But also, like, you know, at the end of the day, I get to say, and I get to look across my room right now and go, oh, look, I have all these books that I published. I, I think that you got to look at, you know, we, we have this finite amount of time on Earth. How do you want to spend your time? Do you yeah. just want to spend yeah. it writing marketing copy all day, or do you want to spend it making something that connects with people? Um, yeah. And, you know, you brought up Geek Chemist Revolution. I have never seen people um, so emotional at conventions when they see me as when they read that book. As they'll, they'll come up to me and they will cry. And they will say, oh, my God, this is exactly how I felt when you captured this. And that is a crazy feeling. Yep. yep. Thank you. That is an absolutely brilliant answer. Um, and just as we're wrapping up, where can people find you if they are looking for you and, you know, feel free to plug yourself in your books really quick. Uh, my latest book to come out was a short story collection called Future Artifacts. And then also The Light Brigade, I think was my last novel. You can find me online uh, at Cameron Hurley and it's Cameron with a K dot com. Um, that is my website for all things uh, that are going on. I think I am not super social on social media, except for Instagram. I think that's the only one I've kept. So you can find me there. Uh, at Cameron Harley, the rest are kind of just placeholders. You've been listening to the Publishing Radio Podcast with Sunny Dean and Scott Drakeford. Tune in next time for more in-depth discussion on everything publishing industry. See you later.